Okay, so I uh, work at Pivotal on Greenplum. I wanted to give a talk about Postgres Planner. And the goals of it are to provide a tangible, trivial example. So this is not going to be a super fancy optimization. Um, and to actually start a discussion on what is involved in uh, adding an optimization. So some type of new optimization to Planner. Okay. Uh, I have a table of contents, which is mainly useful for as we come back to each part to know what we're doing. I'm going to talk about planning basics. And then I'm going to go over the guidelines that I usually think of when I'm adding a uh, thinking about an optimization uh, for planner, take into account that I've mostly worked on old-timey planner, because um, like older versions of planner. I have not worked on uh, the, the patches you'll see are on uh, uh, current Postgres, but most of the, um, the planner that I've worked on is, is older. So I don't talk about partitioning or uh, planning for parallel or JIT or any of that is taken into account. So. Um, and there's a case study and then some discussion. Okay, so if you want to, at the beginning, go look up the patches that I'm going to talk about. They're on my fork of Postgres. And then there's also the slides, this PDF, and the glossary of terms is there as well. Um, so query planning. You go from a query to somehow magically get results. We're going to talk about the arrow in the middle. Um, so a query, a SQL query is parsed, and then uh, query planning happens, and then that resulting plan tree is executed. In Postgres, there are a couple of data structures that we're going to talk about, so I just wanted to put them up here so you could see them. This is the query tree. So a query like this, you can see it's color-coded. The constants 1, 2, and 4 are there in the query tree. Uh, and I'm going to be using uh, plan tree visualization diagrams like this for the rest. Um, so bef the sort of first phase uh, of planning, I'm going to call it semantic optimization. So these are uh, transformations that you can make to the query tree that are uh, lo logical, based only on the SQL query itself. Um, and it has to be a, you have to create, the transformation you do has to result in a semantically equivalent tree. So. Constant folding is one classic example of this. You can evaluate a function and then replace it with the result of that evaluation, or an evaluate an expression, rather. Um, and so this is the same query, the query tree before and after uh, this optimization. After doing some sort of pre-processing and semantic optimization, we do uh, cost-based optimization. So this is related to the actual data, uh, and you in the underlying uh, relations and different statistics about the data decisions during planning. Join order is the most common one that people talk about. And then after you've done some of the, there are others. Uh, so for example, you might find that if you're doing a series of joins, given whatever predicates are on uh, the joins, that it might be better to order them uh, in that way versus the first way based on the selectivity, uh, or how many rows are filtered out by a predicate, as an example. After that, you'll uh, sort of considering those different join orders, you'll add access paths and do costing so you can actually decide on a given join order. There's a lot more there, but I'm going to move on for now. Um, there's other good presentations on this topic. So plan tree, this is the plan statement data structure that I'll also be using throughout the presentation. The plan tree member of it's the one that we care most about. Uh, and this is a visualization of that. Oh, also, please interrupt me with corrections, questions, comments. I might uh, respond to you by saying I'm going to address that later. So, but yes, please interrupt me. I like being interrupted. I want this to be a discussion. Okay. So my guidelines. Uh, the, there's sort of four questions that I um, think about or ask myself about when I'm a lot of times when I'm reviewing uh, PRs. So I also worked on Orca, which is uh, the pivotal other. Uh, query optimizer that Pivotal created. Um, so some of this is this sort of crosses over regardless of what query optimizer you're working on. So the first one is, does your optimization always retain semantic correctness? So the this is an example from the optimizer readme. But basically, if you have uh, there, uh, you can't move inner joins to the nullable side of some an outer join. So this is just one of the classic examples of the type of optimization that you can't do because you it's not semantically equivalent. You could get wrong results. 
so the second rule is the one that I think is the most fun, which is, does it inhibit downstream optimization? So this kind of, for me, breaks up into three parts or sort of different components. And the first is that optimization order matters. So there's a couple, bunch of comments in the code in planner.c, a lot of them, uh, that talk about different uh, pre-processing steps and why it matters if you do one before another. So uh, this query, and we're gonna come back to this rule, so I'll just kind of gloss over the example a little bit, but basically in this example, you have a, a subquery, and then you have uh, two uh, quals here, a equals c and c equals seven, and you know in the initial query tree, those are the quals on the query, and then you have the v equals five from the, in the subquery. But we, we do subquery pull up before we try to uh, do any sort of pre-processing or contradiction detection on the actual quals. And the reason is that we're able to, uh, in, in this case specifically, uh, if we do that, we can determine that, so we have by transitivity A equals seven. So down here, we can actually, if we do the pull up and then the pre-processing, we can tell that seven and five actually are never gonna be equal. So we can turn this entire query into a, a no op basically. Does that make sense? I haven't done this slide for anyone yet, so I don't know if it makes sense. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so the next part of uh, does it inhibit downstream optimization? So I think of it, uh, this one is sort of the classic, well, this optimization is great for that class of query, but uh, here's an example of another type of query which it causes a regression for. Um, and we'll get into that a little more. And the last one is, I, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but it, I included it because I've been reviewing old rejected planner patches. I've been looking back to 2014 uh, and since, and what I've noticed is that one of the most common reasons for returning or rejecting patches, it has to do with um, uh, expectations that different parts of the code have the number of, also it's a big source of bugs, but, uh, a number of columns, one was supposed to be there and it was removed, or the group I was supposed to be like this, or the range table was supposed to be aligned with the target list in this or that way. So a lot of these sort of expectations that are implementation specific about the query tree and then eventually the plan tree uh, are important to think about, but are less cool, so I'm not gonna talk about them right now. Okay, so number three is uh, is the improvement in execution time worth, worth the cost in planning time? The, there's a lot of examples of this. Um, people talk about you know, catalog lookups, things like that, but I think joint order is the most classic sort of database-y problem like this, which is that if you do a fully exhaustive uh, joint order uh, to, to determine the best joint order, given perfect statistics and exhaustive search, you can get the best joint order, but uh, that's not, not usually very uh, worthwhile uh, and would cause planning time to be quite long. And number four is, is the, comp so this is basically in all programming or software development, but is the cost of the complexity cost uh, that of the code that you added worth the performance benefit? And again, looking at uh, patches that had been returned, a lot of times it was, well, you added a whole new API and I don't really know if this case is very common or this is a very obscure feature that no one cares about, I don't want all this code I have to maintain or this API is interesting but I don't see any reuse potential, so. Okay, so we're gonna do a case study, two tables, each with one column and this is the query. So I did do this at uh, same query at the talk at uh, Postgres Open last year, so some of this will be review. The semantics of this query are uh, for every tuple and foo, you're gonna, uh, for each A, you're gonna see does there exist a B in bar which is equal to null? So just quick review of null semantics, so we're all on the same page. Ternary logic with null, the, p the part that's most important here is for the equality column, if either P or Q is null, then the equality is going to evaluate to null. That's important for the semantics of our query. So 
I thought that because the qual would never be true, that we would have this plan, a result node with a one-time filter false. I don't know if anyone really knows what a result node is, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but basically in this case, it's letting us project even though we're not doing anything. It's letting us return a column. Uh, so this is not the plan that I, I got. I got this plan, which requires at least a scan of foo and a scan of var, uh, at least one, depending on uh, a few things. But so I was like, well, is that really necessary? It doesn't seem necessary for correctness because the call will never be true. And so the, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I decided that it wasn't necessary and that I wanted to, to change it. So how do you go about doing that? Um, and there's just a series of steps. I don't know if that's what everyone does, but it's just what I kind of think of. And the first thing I do is characterize the query. So this is just getting a minimal repro. That's all that this is. But uh, basically, what is the part of the query that's most important, is most impacting the thing that we don't want? So what about the query actually matters that we want to actually change? Because that's important because the query trees get big. So you want to focus on just the part you care about. So we don't care if there's a select, in the select list there was a bunch of aggregates, like reduce all the noise and then think about the part you care about. So in this case, it's when you have a provably untrue qual, uh, what, what other queries that have a provably untrue qual do get optimized into, I'm gonna call it a no-op plan, a result node with a, a filter, a oh, one-time filter false. So what are some queries that have that kind of plan? So that's my next step, which is analog, so finding an analogous query. So this is the most basic example. Uh, get A from foo where false, and that does not scan anything, which is great. <laughs> and so then the next level up is, okay, well is it, about, uh, is it about null? Is the reason that this is not getting optimized about null? I'm the next basic question. And no, that's null equals seven is sort of the most basic thing that evaluate function can do <laughs> during constant folding. So that gives us our no-op plan. And just for going forward as a note on my notation, I'm gonna elide the parts of the query tree that are not relevant to what we're talking about so you'll see sort of a simplified version. So then the next thing that I do is identify the transformation that's happening to the query tree that turns it into a query tree that can be turned into the plan. Because um, not most of what's happening that we care about during semantic optimization is going to happen to the, everything that we care about is gonna to happen to the query tree itself. So uh, in this case, for null equals seven, during, uh, you know, during constant folding, we're gonna take the qual and we're gonna evaluate it and it's gonna get turned into a null, a const. So for the next query, for uh, the next analog that I used was, is it about a subquery? So my question was, is it that, uh, that when we have an expression where one argument is a subquery, it can't be optimized for some reason? And that's, not, uh, that's actually not true. If, if you have this type of uh, query, so note that there's no any sublink. So there's, it's just an expression sublink. So this does get optimized. And the type of transformation that happens is the, in, you know, so the entire qual, it's a different expression. It looks a little bit different, but uh, it gets turned into a constant null. So this is our original query, null equals any select D from bar. And this is what, it does have constant folding done to it. I mean, we go and we attempt to do the best that we can. And you can see over here this test expression. So the, the sublinks test expression gets folded into a constant null. So we do, we do something, and that's a transformation that's happening. So now I'm thinking, you know, where can I sort of inject something? Uh, and if you compare the three queries, these are their original query trees, and this is after uh, we've done constant folding on the query tree, null equals seven and null equals select b from bar have the same post-processed or pre-processed -pre query tree, and null equals any has its qual is rooted at a sublink node. And then in the end you get these plans, so null equals seven and null equals select b from bar have the same plan in the end. 
So then I had two ideas for uh, places to add this optimization. The first was in constant folding. So what we talked about in the beginning with my guidelines is uh, that, that first you would do the, the pull up of the any sublink into a join and then you would do constant folding. So I thought let's just add a sublink case to a constant folding, to the constant folding mutator. And so I did that and the basically this is what's happening now and my idea was just to add a, a case that said if it's a sublink and it has a test expression, evaluate that expression. If it, if it returns a constant null, then instead of just return that from the sublink case. Um, and I guess what I thought was that if I could just eliminate that pesky sublink, I would be able to keep from having a subplan in the final plan and then that would let me get rid of the rest of the plan. Um, so I wanted this transformation to happen and I did it and I got the plan I wanted but it turns out that that actually violates my first guideline which is that it needs to be semantically correct in all cases. So, yes. Okay. I, I knew that we would never need to scan the, well, we would never return data, so we wouldn't, we didn't need to scan the yeah, table. Yeah. yeah, and then where can I add code that will make that not happen? Yeah. yeah. So, um, no semantics we talked about before. Now we're gonna talk about any semantics, capital A and Y. So, um, Back to the question this is asking. So does there exist a B in var which is equal to unknown? So the really cool thing is that we can actually just ask Postgres the answer to this by moving it into the select list because when it's in the where clause, it's filtering our results. When it's in the select list, we can actually see our results, right? So uh, in this case, we get a row back. It's null. Postgres is like, well, I don't know if null equals any because that's unknown. Now, if we truncate bar, we get false. And that's because if you ask, does, is there a B in bar which is equal to null? And there, if there are no Bs in bar, the answer can definitively be false. So. Now when it's in the where clause like it was originally, we get the same answer regardless. We get nothing, zero rows are returned. So this is just a side by side of the query tree for when it, the null equals any expression is in the select list versus when it's in the where clause. And you, it's pretty similar, just different parts of the query. So this transformation doesn't work because if it's in the select list, you can get wrong results. So what could we do instead? Uh, so I just scoped it to the qual only. There's a really convenient function called preprocess qual conditions that uh, I just added the same logic there. So if after constant folding, the test expression is a constant null, replace the sublink with it. Um, and that, that worked. And I got the plan I wanted. But I guess I, I'm arguing that it kind of breaks my fourth rule, which is this is a really uh, specific query. It only works if the argument, the constant is a null. And I, I don't know how common of a use case it is. So Maybe there was a reason there wasn't a sublink case in the constant folding mutator. Um, so alternatively, I thought about what if we added it to the any sublink pull up. So going back to the original query, null equals any select B from bar, finding analogs. The first analog here I tried was replacing the, uh, the null with A. So uh, uh, A is from foo. I don't know why I made it yellow, because that makes it less clear. But yeah, it's the same A from foo. And so this gets pulled up into a join. And it's because we are, in this case, semantically saying this is basically the same thing as if we evaluated the equality of A and B. As long as we've deduplicated B, we can do this as a hash join. Um, so now, 
with null, I thought maybe we can just pretend that null is part of foo and then do this as a join also. This was the idea. Um, so in convert any sublink to join is the function where this is happening. I just added, and you, the original slide that had the code on it has these um, three patches. But yeah, so you can see that uh, the, tree, the query trees are pretty different at this stage for, um, so this is for A equals any after we, so the original query tree is here, and then we pull up the sublink into a join. And so this is after convert any sublink to join with a bar on the left side. Okay, so then these are the two query trees, A equals any and null equals any, and they're basically the same except for here's the var and there's a const over there. Um, so it seemed fine, seemed like a good idea. And so then this is after, and again, they're exactly the same except under the op expert you have a var versus a const for null. Um, so with my patch, I was able to get that type of uh, shape and then I could get the no op plan. So I basically turned the query into select A from foo join bar where null equals a deduplicated B. Um, so that was cool, I thought. And the kind of cooler part of it originally that I thought of was contradiction detection for a case like this. So what if instead of just doing it for constant null, I did it for all constants and I could detect this kind of case where seven equals any select B from bar B equals five, well five and seven are never gonna be equal. This seemed really cool. <laughs> But, so I get this no-op plan, but then I was like, um, yeah, so what about when there's not a contradiction? Then you get potentially worse plans. So I actually don't know because I haven't timed it, but I imagine that if you make a hash subplan, if you have a hash subplan on a case that's pretty simple, that it would be faster than doing it as a, a, a nested loop semi-join. I, again, I didn't time it, but it seems like you have the potential if you did this for generating much worse plans in lots of cases. So just going back one slide, because I might have done that too fast. We, you get why this is not, you don't need to act, you can, you're not gonna produce results, right? Okay, yeah. Um, but I didn't think really hard about it, because I was mostly doing this for this presentation, so I don't know, but I think in a lot of cases you'll get worse plans uh, if you made this optimization. It also seems kind of silly if you think about it, but I, because seven is not part of foo. But I, I, I do think that there's a potential to do something, something kind of fancier than what we currently do. Like maybe you could move, somehow you could move the seven down and make it a filter or something on the scan and then you could do the contradiction detection. But, or you could, yeah, I, I think that there's something that we can do to, to do better than this. But I think the other really important thing to note is that it's not just that you could get a worse plan in some cases, it's that what you, during this stage of planning, during semantic optimization, the way that um, you don't produce alternatives and then pick based on cost. So once you have decided, hey, let's do a join instead of a, a subplan, you, you don't get to go back and redo it once you have stats, access to stats and things like that. So, once you make a choice during semantic optimization, it has to be basically always better. And this isn't an example of that yet. You're saying because you have three kinds of ways to join versus just a hash subplan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't thought about that, but I guess increased flexibility is good. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things from working on this presentation that I thought a lot about was cases when hash subplans were good because I think Traditionally, especially working on Greenplum, I've learned to hate subplans and look for a subquery pull-up at all costs. So, um, but I think 
when it's done well and the hash table you're making is quite small, it can be pretty fast. And um, but the other thing is, I'm pretty sure that the hash table for hash subplane, like that can't spill, right? You can't if you make it too big. No, 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 hash, no, the for, the, for a hash subplan, the hash table that you actually build. Oh, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Okay. That's what I meant. Yeah. Well, so well, that would be a problem in Green Plum for us, actually. So I think sometimes there's a good reason to make everything into a join because there's a lot of work around optimizing and making joins work well, I would say. Uh, okay, so. I think this breaks two and four. I th would argue that at least in one case, you can pr you'll produce worse plans when the join isn't eliminated. And it's a pretty narrow case again. So we, we're favoring contradiction detection um, when you have a constant left argument kind of specific. Going back just on the guidelines, uh, again, just to review, we talked about one, semantic correctness, we talked about, uh, you know, two downstream optimizations and potential regressions, which I would say that um, we didn't talk much about planning time um, or complexity cost that much, but those, there's lots of good examples out there of, uh, in, past commit, in the CommitFest app, you can look at past patches and see kind of some of the arguments. I think these are some of the most common reasons patches don't get in for optimizations. Um, some of my other ideas that were brought up using the stats, this of course does not work because perfect stats, uh, your stats can get stale, your stats are usually stale and wrong, so you can't just tell that, uh, the, the, in order to tell that um, the subquery that the table's empty so that you can do it no matter what part of, so you could do the constant folding in every select list, square clause, whatever. Um, so you can't rely on stats. Another suggestion was to actually execute the subquery to see if the table is empty. I, I think that probably has a significant, uh, would, would violate rule four of adding code complexity and potentially performance impact as well. Um, so I wanted to have a discussion in the last, whatever, 10 minutes, we can do questions first. But uh, what I've started doing is looking back at, as I said before, at planner patches from all the way back to 2014, and what I what I kind of want to 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 start to understand is what what are the things that so let's say that you you know are a Postgres user and you think of you get this plan it's not a good plan and you're like this optimization is semantically correct and would make this plan better so what is the gap between that moment and then actually your patch being committed. Um, so I'm uh, glossing over the first part of it where you're writing the code, getting, you know, there's other presentations that talk about getting a text editor and all the kind of like sort of procedural steps, but actually the code, let's say you wrote a patch that works for your query. What's the gap between there and something that's committable to Postgres? And I mean, it's kind of a, a, it's a difficult question to answer, but I think the more data points we have the closer we can get to making it easier for people out there that see bad plans to help us to improve planner and not just from a theoretical sort of database perspective, but actually from a practical user perspective. And then we'll have more people hacking on planner. And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. There are things, when is it okay during planning to do things like go get something from PG Constraint? Um, when is it okay to mutate the plan tree? When is it okay to use path keys for something that they're not already being used for? Um, so I wanted to talk about that. And I also wanted other people, if you have guidelines that you use when you're thinking about query optimizations, I wanted to see what they were. So.
That's an interesting idea. That for orca, that's something that w we use a lot of gucks to kind of enable and disable certain types of optimizations. And then for the ones that are exposed to the user, they can enable ones that are more relevant to them or not, um, which I understand has its own people have thoughts about. But uh, I, the one of the things that I was talking to them last week that they've been discussing recently is having as you said, kind of a two-stage optimization process where there are a base set of optimizations that might happen or transformations that might happen, and then uh, you continue to do planning. So you produce a plan, and then after that, you continue to run the other transformations. And only if you, uh, and, and Norca produces all, like 10, 10 alternatives from each transformation, or it's configurable, so full alternative plans, which is different. Um, but you you only consider and continue to produce alternatives if they cost uh, less than the plan that you chose with your sort of initial pass of optimization. Um, so there's lots of little tricks like that. Anybody else? Other thoughts or questions? never thought about that. So it would have to be something like user defined function or some, yeah. Do we ever, is there, I don't, I've never seen a part of Planner that would say require, require that a subquery can, well, if a subquery gets pulled up to a join, I can't think of any place where we say you have to keep this because it has a function in it, but. A function, well, the function would have had to be volatile. Yeah, if it's volatile, then you have to execute it, yeah. And I don't think, could you make a user-defined function that wasn't volatile, that created, had a side effect like that? So role reversal hash joins specifically, we do not do unless, yeah, we don't do that as far as I can recall. But what would you consider that class of types of optim? I can't think what else would be analogous to that. Um, or so different. I mean, there are a number of uh, sort of <laughs> that was my whole goal the whole time period. Um, I also, just for the sake of time, I wanted to um, put up here, there are two presentations that uh, Robert Haas, there's probably more online, and Tom Lane, some presentations. Robert Haas has a 
couple of them on Planner, and Tom Lane has one that goes through some of the names of the major functions and things like that. You can also look at the optimizer readme is really good. Um, and so these are good sources for getting some more basic information I kind of wanted to touch on specifically thinking about thinking about optimizations. Um, and then of course old planner patches are a good source as well. Um, and then this is the link to the code and the slides again, the patches. And um, for reference. Well, I guess no one has anything else to say. Okay. I won't get you in trouble, Peter. I did not, yeah, so Orca is a top-down planner. One of the things that Peter and I were talking about yesterday that I think is interesting is that I actually don't know enough, I mean, I don't know enough about query optimizers to be able to ha come up with an example where the thing that makes it easier to add new optimizations to Orca has anything to do with the theoretical difference of being top-down versus bottom-up. But the architecture itself, the way that it is, one thing we talked about is that once you have an optimization in mind, actually the act of adding it is usually you can get to the point of doing that in a month and, and uh, like uh, as opposed to I think the architecture of planner makes it a little bit more time consuming to get to the point where you can add code that is architecturally consistent. Um, the ordering doesn't matter. Yes, the ordering, well, other than yeah. in conceptually, but the literal ordering, yeah. Yeah, I totally added stuff then didn't look at any of the other code <laughs> like uh, when when adding it, which is not a luxury you have with the plan. Yeah. <laughs> it also kind of can lead to bit rot though. No one ever has to look at any of the rest of the code. But all right, let's let's get one person who hasn't asked a question or brought up a point to do it. And I'm gonna call someone out by name and embarrass them if no one volunteers. Okay. Three, two, one. All right. Jimmy. <laughs> Do you have any questions or comments or thoughts? I planted him in the audience, actually. <laughs> yes? Uh, you ever have issues where you have two versions of the same function, and you end up with two different sets of implementations? So where you end up with So I have never looked at the, so Postgres has its own uh, window implementation that is become a little more similar to upstream Postgres now. I mean, so I've never looked at it and it's scary and I've never had to, so that's the answer to that. Um, over there.
So the question was, what kind of work is being done on optimizing self-joins? I'll defer this to, to Tom. I've looked at some past rejected planners on, patches on that, um, but I don't know what the latest and greatest is. Like removing self-joins, I think, is what you're saying? Yeah, one thing I didn't talk about was how to figure out if the optimization you would like to add is going to benefit a large enough class of query. That I don't have an answer for. Um, okay, last, I just have to acknowledge, so the diagrams were all made in PICS, and uh, I copy pasta this from someone else. Uh, so Kai Ting made these diagrams initially made a couple of trees for me, and so I copy-pasted and replaced everything. But we're working on trying to make a little library that will let you give some parameters to generate plan trees. Um, so, and then Jesse for going over a lot of my examples with me. And then that's it.